Uh, but thanks for coming out in the heat. It is a really nasty day out there. Uh, but I have come to talk about Park and Archaeological State Park. And the, and the first thing I want to mention, actually, is that uh, we don't use the word tribes very often when we talk archaeologically. Because since we're talking about prehistory, uh, we don't have the... Do you want me to stop? No, you're loud. Oh, I am loud. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Do you want me to start completely over? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to. Go ahead. <laughs> so anyway, archaeologically, uh, we don't talk too much about the word tribe because there were there was no written history, and so we actually don't really know how these people organize themselves. We only organize them in our archaeological terms, in the way that we excavate sites and organize artifacts and uh, you know, look at that kind of information. So the way that we uh, learn about and function with Native American tribes today uh, is very different than how we think about them and learn about them and, and uh, talk about them uh, prehistorically. So, I, I, I may jump back and forth between those kinds of terms, but generally a more archaeologically accurate way to, to talk about people is uh, in terms of you know the, their culture. And so at Park and Archaeological State Park, the uh, Indians or the American Indians that are most what represented by artifactual evidence are called the Mississippian Indians. And again, that's a totally modern term. We don't know what they call themselves uh, per se. Uh, so the uh, archaeologists used a big grand term called Mississippian Indians to represent anyone that lived uh, somewhere along the Mississippi River between 1200 and 1600 AD. So that's, you know, that's like calling a, you know, a, an Arkansan and a Louisiana and a, a, you know, a, a Michiganian, like the same, per, you know, the same kind of culture, which we're not now. So we can't assume that the Mississippians back then were all the same culture, but because we, we lack so much information about them, everybody that lived during that time period you know, made relatively similar kinds of pottery and stuff, so they're kind of lumped together uh, in, in that one term. So the Mississippians of Parkin are, uh, are the, is the tribe or culture or group of people uh, that is most represented there, although you'll see some other uh, um, time periods represented, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But just to sort of give you a background, where is Parkin? Well, we're here in Little Rock, of course. And if you go east on 40 for about two hours, you'll, uh, you'll just be 12 miles south of Parkin. So Parkin is uh, just east of Wynn, and it's just north and west of uh, West Memphis, and about 30, 35 to 40 minutes uh, east, uh, west of downtown Memphis. So we're pretty close to Memphis on the eastern side of Arkansas. And at our park, we actually do have a couple of different things represented there, not just the uh, American Indian time period, but at, at our park, we actually interpret um, three different points of history, and the one point is a long period of time when the when the Mississippian Indians were there, and the uh, we call it the village of Koski, and I, I, I said we don't even know any of the words that these folks used, but we know one, and that's because Hernando de Soto came in June of 1541 and actually wrote down that he mo he met uh, Chief Koski of the village of Koski, so we we are we use that one Mississippian term that came down to us from him. Uh, which is very few and far between of any other words that were written down. So the, uh, you know, the, the Koski Indians were there for at least three or four, even 500 years. And then for two days, we have history represented by uh, Hernando de Soto's visit, which I'll get into a little bit in descriptive uh, terms uh, as I go through what the park is about. And then finally, uh, w long after the American Indian settlement was gone, there was a sawmill on site that uh, was built and houses and a school and a cemetery was all associated with that. So uh, we actually you know, talk about two very different time periods and two very different lifestyles for visitors when we're at the park. And it actually confuses kids a lot because sometimes we get over to the, to the sawmill stuff and they're like, the Indians are buried here? You know, in the historic cemetery and stuff. So that kind of gets a little bit confusing. Um, but we still, we still like to, to uh, recognize that a lot happened in history throughout time. And it's a nice um, thing to be able to talk about land use over a very long period of time as opposed to just one period of history. Uh, and, and of course, I'm not going to talk too much about the Northern Ohio Mill and Cooperage today. Uh, maybe I'll come back for another lunchtime talk to talk about that or somebody else will from the park because that's a very rich time period as well. 
Um, but I'm gonna focus on the American Indian section. And uh, first of all, again, since I had mentioned they didn't leave any written records behind, the, the way that we know all the stuff that we know about Parkin and many other prehistoric sites is that it gets dug by archeologists. We dig it. And even though there are very, very few excavations at Parkin anymore, which disappoints a lot of visitors that think they're coming to an open archeological site where they're gonna see archeologists in the pits, uh, we, we don't do much digging anymore because so much was excavated in the 60s and the 90s that they have a lot of information. They have um, a very good idea, and I'll, you know, this will be, uh, I'll talk a little bit more and show a couple pictures, but we know a pretty good idea about the land, the space that was used, and the artifacts that were used, and the tools and things, and the lifestyle and whatnot. Uh, and, and that's why there's no excavations anymore, because it's essentially a protected site. They're not gonna put an airport on it or anything. So uh, we're just gonna leave it be for, you know, archeologists with laser beams in 300 years that we won't even have to dig. We'll just know exactly what's in the ground and be able to digitally print the artifacts. You know, it'll be really cool. So anyway, since uh, archeology span is essentially destroying something, uh, we try to preserve as much as we can of the site. But, Regardless, there's been lots of stuff excavated, so we know a lot of information. Uh, we pass the information on in our visitors in a couple of different formats. We have a museum, uh, and it looks, every time I see this picture, it's weird because we just got new carpeting, so it's a totally different view now. Um, but anyway, this is our museum. We've got a lot of artifacts that were found at Parkin, and they've been supplemented by artifacts found at a site called Hazel. Uh, which is north uh, of, Har of Parkin, but of the same exact time period, contemporary sites. And then uh, we also have a case uh, from the, the enemy, the Pakaha, uh, and those were the enemy of the Kaski uh, during the DeSoto time period. So we have a few uh, artifacts from the, from, the, uh, from the Pakaha people, but it's to show how similar the cultures really were, uh, in that it, just because they were in a different region doesn't necessarily mean they were totally different cultures. The pottery looks very, very similar. So we've got a museum. We've got, I don't know if you can see that little tiny picture, but we've got uh, a couple of, you know, really fun uh, touch tables where we've got all kinds of replica artifacts uh, and, and tools and weapons and, you know, deadly things like blow darts and spears and swords from the DeSoto period. And, you know, we've got all kinds of fun stuff for people to touch and play with and, um, you know, just get a feel for what, uh, what life was like and, and what things were, were made of back then. And then also we have a walking site that's about three quarters of a mile uh, paved uh, trail that goes around what was the American Indian Village and the Sawmill Town. Um, and on that site, uh, there's lots of wayside panels and stuff that, that you can take a walk on. But anyway, that's just a little bit about the, the site itself. But about the people that live there, uh, again, they were the Mississippian culture. And this is sort of a mock-up of what the village may have looked like. Uh, the, the mound at the bottom uh, is, the, is the only mound that survives at Parkin now. If, if the, picture, the picture could have been added, you could have added a few more mounds because we know there were probably other mounds on site at that time. Uh, but they've since been leveled from cultivation and, and just land use. But anyway, there's a, 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 you know, a mound uh, with a plaza in front of it probably. Uh, it's all bounded around by a moat. Uh, the very, the bottom end of the moat, which is actually the west side of the village, uh, is actually the St. Francis River. And then the other three sides were probably dug by the uh, folks to build a moat around to, uh, for protection. During this time period, there were warring tribes and people were getting a little bit more testy because the populations were getting bigger and they were probably fighting with each other for territory and hunting grounds and all kinds of stuff. So they were having to protect their villages with moats as well as walls. Uh, so there was probably a wall around the side as well, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but basically it was, uh, it, what this doesn't show here, which the little tiny picture on the bottom shows, which you can't see very well, is that the site was actually located on the St. Francis River at the confluence of the St. Francis and the Tyranza Rivers. So it was a really good meeting point for a lot of villages from different areas to be coming and meeting and trading. And it was probably a, um, a major village at that time period that was a place where people would come and do trade and stuff. And we've got some luxury items that were found at the site that definitely showed that they were probably uh, in control of a lot of the trade routes. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've got some cool artifacts that, that kind of um, add to the fact that they were at a really good uh, spot for, for gaining cool things. 
Uh, and the earliest habitation is actually 1300, but that 1300 was found, or that, that thing that was dated at 1300 was a house that was actually outside of the main village. So they think that there was probably a habitation of earlier Mississippians there uh, that was just in a big long encampment along the river. And then as the Mississippian went on and the, the people had to start to get a little bit more territorial and uh, they, would bu they bunched up into this village and, and abandoned the houses on the outside. Uh, so that's where that earliest habitation comes from. So the main, the main occupation, like when the mound was built and the moat and the wall and all that good stuff was probably 14 to 1600. And uh, at 1600, maybe a little bit late. It was probably 1550 something. About 10 years after DeSoto was there, they probably all left. So talk about that later too. But basically, um, the houses uh, were, were excavated in, in, in their turn in different places. Uh, this, this 1300s house, that early, that one that predates the main village, uh, was excavated in the 90s. And just to let you know, if you haven't seen an archaeological site before, if you're not familiar with what you're looking at, those are not like little square houses. Um, that's the way archaeologists dig. They're square holes that get the uh, intersections left up so you can see the cross section. That doesn't have anything to do with what they actually saw in the ground. It's the grid that archaeologists have to dig in. Um, so that picture is, is difficult to explain sometimes, especially if you know, you're not really listening to what I'm saying um, or, or not reading what a sign would say on it. They think, oh, the Indians lived in little square condominiums. Uh, but it wasn't. It, that's just the way that, the, uh, that they were excavated. But you can see it, you know, it was a, a larger space that was excavated um, and, and that was replicated across the site a few times to get uh, an idea about the density of the houses and stuff. So, there were excavations uh, of the outside place, and you can see there's bricks here, Daniel, you, so you've got your historic stuff here. Um, yeah, there were bricks, and actually, honestly, the re a little bit background of this picture, the reason they actually excavated here, they didn't think there was an earlier settlement. They had no idea. They were looking for the boarding house for the sawmill, because some woman in town said, oh, my father worked at the sawmill, and he lived in a boarding house when he was a bachelor, so, and it was right over there. So they dug right over there, and they found instead a, a 1300s um, American Indian house, and they never found much evidence of, of the sawmill or the boarding houses or anything. Um, so that kind of uh, was a disappointment, but also it added a little bit to the, to the prehistoric section of the site. So uh, that was just a little bit archaeological um, stuff there. But basically, the, uh, the site itself, again, this is sort of another reconstruction of it. Uh, as far as maybe a little bit less dense housing, but still it was pretty dense. There was probably, I think they think there was like 600 houses representing 2,000 people. And just to give you an idea, this is probably only about 16 or 17 acre village. So that's a very highly populated, noisy, stinky, smelly, crowded, congested place. Uh, but then again, they didn't have cars, traffic, uh, it was only, you know, human voice noise and, and dog barking noise. And uh, so you got to think about our idea about congestion and back then congestion. Uh, it was probably a lot different, um, a little bit more slow paced here, but still pretty crowded. Um, and that was, again, because they had to, they felt like they had to um, defend their, uh, their corn. You know, uh, <laughs> you think about what they have to, uh, to, to try and, um, you know, keep to themselves and to try to defend, you know, they didn't have stuff. They didn't have like money, of course. They didn't have nice things and family. I mean, they had family heirlooms, but it was probably like in the form of a necklace that they were wearing or something. So they, there wasn't really anything major except for the, the population, the people themselves and the food stores, which was normally mostly corn. They were a very uh, major corn agricultural society. So they had corn cribs all over that they were storing for uh, long periods of time. And so they would, the raiding would consist of stealing women and corn, basically. Uh, so that's why the walls were up. But of course, nowadays it looks a lot different because we have a big visitor center stuck on the front of it, uh, actually on the back of the village. And, uh, but inside our museum, we still are able to um, you know, acknowledge the fact that there was a, an incredibly uh, strong culture that was there 500 years ago. Uh, so the wall itself, um, we call it a palisade, even though it's not really what you think of as a palisade that was like on a castle thing. 
Um, it was just more like a log wall that was uh, built around the village. And actually, of course, there's no wall still standing. But the, uh, what, in the 90s, when they had different sections of the site open for archaeology, they did find uh, a spot that, you know, they were kind of digging along where they thought the wall should have been, because a lot of Mississippian villages have this wall. And they actually did find uh, the, the post holes or the uh, reminiscent um, shadows where the, where the holes would have been from after they pulled the wall out, basically. Uh, so there were these big walls, if you look at that little picture, with all those little um, uh, circles in a row. That's literally what it looks like on the ground. There's these little circles that follow each other. And they even found, uh, to the great excitement of, of all the archaeologists, they found a bastion. So it was part of the wall that would poke out a little bit that could function as a little guard hut. So they, they even learned more than just the fact that there was a wall, but there was actually like a little guard hut. Now, they didn't extend it all the way. I mean, they didn't dig all the way around all 17 acres, but there was a good enough spot where they were very confident that there was a long wall and that there was at least one bastion poking out. So they got, you know, that's interesting information that you can think of that they've got people that have to have to guard not just have a wall to make people not come in anywhere they want but also have people have to defend it so that's pretty neat and you know that little cartoon about just the wall uh, that would have been lashed together with river cane and uh, then probably constantly maintained with mud or clay and so that was a, a major maintenance project that would have been uh, something that people would have spent their entire lives dealing with, constantly fixing the wall. Because you think about organic stuff and, and it rotting over the two, three hundred year time period that this village was inhabited. Every year somebody was going to have to start working on some, you know, it's like I-40 uh, construction. You finish on one end and you start on the other end again. It's the same thing with the wall. So, to, you know, to kind of put into action what, what you think people were doing all day. Well, there were some folks that spent half their lives working on that wall. <laughs> Just, you know, fixing it and getting the resources and uh, you know, felling the, the river cane or felling even the timber if they needed to, to fix certain portions and then getting the clay or the mud and, you know, uh, slapping it up there all the time. So that's, that's a big work job that somebody was always doing. Uh, and then there was actually this moat that was dug around at least three edges, probably more like two. One of the edges was a, a natural ravine. And then the other edge, remember, was the St. Francis River. So there was at least two edges that were hand dug um, and there's no beasts of burden during this time period. So, uh, again, something to think about for what people were doing all day. Well, they, were, they didn't have shovels, and they didn't have wagons, and they didn't have the wheel. And to move all this dirt out of the moat, probably, you know. And then with flooding, if it would cave in, they had to maintain the moat and all this good stuff. And, again, this was part of the defense mechanism. Some people wonder if they... Uh, irrigated water that way too, like got water out to more of the crops, but we don't, we don't have evidence of that. I mean, it makes sense, but we're not really sure. But the moat is still noticeable today on the landscape. So has anybody been to Parkin? Okay, oh, three, oh, four. Okay, good. So you know the moat's there, right? When you go there, you can actually see it. It's not filled with water, but it's a definite depression on the landscape. Uh, even though the, saw, the sawmill folks tried real hard to fill it in, with sawdust, the sawdust eventually uh, disintegrated over the past 80 years, and now it's back down to this little depression all the way around the site. And it's a trough that does sometimes fill up with water uh, when, when it rains real hard, not from the river itself, but just from just rain in general. And um, it's a great pool for my dogs, so they swim around it all the time when, it's, uh, when, <laughs> when the water goes through. But anyway, this sort of gives you a little bit of a better idea of like, you know, the moat, and then there would have been a wall, and then the site itself is on this kind of raised platform. Um, the, whole, the whole site's about 8 to 10 feet above the regular natural land surface, uh, and that helped just in general with, with flooding, uh, the yearly flooding that the St. Francis River used to endure. Now, the mound itself, and this is a, uh, a function of a lot of both Mississippian and woodland villages. Um, Toltec over here in, uh, in East Little Rock is a woodland time period, so 500 years before uh, the Mississippian, they were building mounds. And actually, the ladies at, um, at Toltec call me the president of the Itty Bitty Mound Committee because the Parkin Mound is small compared to the Toltec Mounds. Not to, you know, not want you to, I don't want you to not come visit because it's still a cool place to come to. But it's not as quite impressive as the Toltec Mounds. 
Uh, it's only about 30, 30 feet tall, but it's pretty wide because it was probably a double mound. Uh, there was probably, I call it the mother-in-law's mound or something, you know, this little mound on the side there that probably had other houses. But both of these mounds, or the, at least the main one, had, uh, ha let me go back one, had, had a house on top of it, the chief's house. And at the time DeSoto was there, you know, he actually described the village itself and described everything that we saw archaeologically, as well as a house with uh, cow skulls hanging off the roof. They weren't cows, they were bison, because they didn't have cows back then. But, you know, same, same concept, uh, there, were, there were cow skulls on top, so that's why there's little skulls up there. But basically, the mound itself, again, is only about 30 feet tall now, but it was probably quite bigger back then. It's, it's endured a lot of erosion. Uh, the back of it slumps back down off a big, huge drop to the river. You know, people have driven cars up it. They cut the front off of it to build a highway, you know, like a road right in front of it during sawmill times. So this poor thing has been... Um, subject of a lot of abuse in the, in the years. There was a house on it in the 1940s. There was a tree grown out of the top of it when they got to it. You know, it's, just, it's, it's kind of, you know, seen its share of uh, erosional um, uh, stuff going on. So, but it's still there and it really is impressive to, you know, most people when you actually get up to it because what you've got to think about is that it was on totally flat land because the Delta is totally flat. And these people probably moved about 250,000 basket loads. So that's a quarter million basket loads of dirt to build this thing. And then again, just like the, the wall or the palisade, you would have had to maintain it constantly. Uh, they had, there must have been steps somewhere on it to get to the top, but we don't know exactly where they were. Uh, but there, you know, there would have had to have been some kind of maintenance going on with the thing all the time. Now, there's nothing inside of it. Um, some, there's no burials or anything like that as far as anybody can tell because that wasn't really a trait of this time period. Uh, it was more of a trait of the Toltec, uh, uh, you know, the woodland time period to put burials in your mound. So this one uh, supposedly doesn't really have anything in it, but it does have one thing, which I'll, well, well, it had one thing until April, and then I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, but I'll, I'll go back to the mound and the historic event that happened on it in a little bit, and I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. But back down to the main village, uh, we do know that the houses were all 13 foot by 13 foot. I should have brought like a string here, but 13 foot, I don't know, you think it's as long as this rug or as wide as, this, wide as, the, room wide as the room maybe? And then, you know, yeah. that's it. So maybe even smaller than that, smaller but pretty small for a house. And it was replicated across the site multiple times. Every time they dig, they find the floors of the house. Floors of houses are generally harder, whether it's because it's packed uh, packed dirt or the house had burned down and the, and the floor had essentially turned into clay. So when you hit it as an archaeologist, you know it. Doom, the shovel just boom, you know, hits off the side, off the floor if you don't know your, your bounds. So anyway, they have found many floors and many outlines of houses that are all 13 by 13 foot. They were probably built with logs and cane and thatch. Um, when I say waddle and daub, a lot of people used to think that the houses were completely covered in mud and uh, they found out during the archaeology that there just wasn't enough mud uh, around the, the edges of the houses to really say that those were definitely all covered in mud. So probably just mud here and there along the hearth poles on the top uh, to keep the, the thatch from catching fire from the sparks and stuff. But anyway, you know, we have a little bit of an idea. Suffice it to say, there weren't teepees, okay? Most, most kids that come to the site, you know, think there were teepees everywhere. And honestly, some adults even think there were teepees there. But there was never a single teepee, probably in Arkansas, ever. Um, and I just, I always like to make sure people understand that these were just regular square houses. Not much stuff in them, but, uh, you know, not much furniture or anything, because they didn't have that kind of technology or, or need for things, really. Uh, but, you know, just really sleeping quarters and places to get in out of the cold and the rain. And maybe to store some stuff. So, who were the Mississippians? Because these people are, you know, relatively not necessarily studied by everybody who studies Arkansas history. Uh, you know, a lot of people lump American Indians into one big category. And a lot of people don't even think of the fact that there were prehistoric Indians and that there are historic Indians and that there are modern Indians that are still functioning in their own governments today. So the, the Mississippians were a people that were originally called the Mound Builders, but they're not anymore because so many mounds have, predate, have been found to predate the Mississippian time period. So if you ever heard the term Mound Builders, a lot of them were referred to as that. 
They didn't come from anywhere. They didn't like come from the mothership or they didn't like move over from the Ohio River Valley or something and take over and start building mounds or start growing corn. They were the people that were in place there for thousands of years and they just adopted new technology and new, and when I say technology, I'm talking the bow and arrow and corn agriculture. That's technology back then. And so, uh, you know, they, they, uh, pottery was already in place. Uh, the bow and arrow was just starting. So, and there was no corn agriculture during the woodland period, which is the period beforehand. So basically it was the same Indians there all the time and where they went is the problem. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what happened to the Mississippians. There was a time period of about 200 years where it seems like no one lived in this whole area of the, of the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, and what, what sort of the thing that makes the most sense to me is that after the Spanish came through, uh, with diseases, and it wasn't just the diseases that messed them up, they were already in stress from having a drought and things like that. Uh, but basically they reorganized themselves into the tribes that we have today. The Caddo, the Quapaw, the Chickasaw, the Tunica, and those were the, the uh, historic um, uh, tribes of Arkansas. And so the Mississippians kind of probably just reorganized themselves. The Caddo uh, are in more, more in western Arkansas. It's the Quapaw that claim the Mississippians as their ancestors. The Quapaw are currently in Quapaw, Oklahoma, but they came from the north, from uh, like St. Louis area, kind of. So they kind of claim them as their ancestors, but we haven't been able to get any DNA done because it's just so, it's prohibitively expensive and just the science isn't, isn't up to par quite yet to, to do with all that stuff. But it is, we have, we have samples set aside uh, from prehistoric remains. We're, we're st I'm working with the Quapaw and we're starting to uh, set samples aside for when, when we do get to do some DNA stuff. So anyway, um, the, the Mississippians, again, were, were people that lived along the Mississippi River all the way up to Minnesota and all the way down to Louisiana. And they really, what, what connected them was the chief's uh, need for shiny. They loved shiny, whether it was copper from the, you know, Michigan, the Great Lakes, or whether it was pretty shiny whelk uh, shell from the Gulf of Mexico. Those two things, those raw materials, were the most highly prized items back then. Uh, mainly for jewelry, uh, those two things, they were making big copper plates, uh, or copper even standard things, like little signs and things. Uh, but basically the raw materials, since we don't have anything in the delta, we don't even have any rock, for crying out loud. So I mean, our trade was even rock that we needed. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the Mississippi River and its tributaries kind of connected everybody in that sense. So that's really who the Mississippians were. They were basically just a big, huge trade network uh, and that, you know, also, of course, shared ideas and things. And uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're, they may be uh, the modern-day uh, Quapaw. So the, the tradition of the Mississippians, what, you know, besides from just their nice pottery that kept them all together, uh, is that they were, they had what we think of as the most elaborate uh, prehistoric cultural tradition, meaning they had a lot of like stuff, like ceremonial items. Of course, archaeologists, when we don't know what, what things were used for, we always call them like ceremonial items. There were things, like little things found in all these archaeological sites, like uh, little stones that were perfectly rounded that they probably played a game called Chunky with. And, you know, all these just like really beautiful, uh, conspicuous consumption items big, huge flint knives and things that you couldn't use, they weren't functional. Uh, you know, all kinds of pottery, like the one on the bottom there, that doesn't look very functional, but it's beautiful. So they had a lot of just really beautiful items and, and things that they obviously had incredibly highly skilled artists that were making um, that give us the, the really beautiful stuff from ancient North America. Uh, and they probably arose when a, a culture called the Hopewell culture, again, I can't really call them a tribe because it was so widespread uh, in the Ohio River Valley and also in the Mississippi River Valley, uh, that we can't really call them a tribe, but the Hopewell culture declined. Uh, you know, we don't know why they did, but they just kind of changed over uh, and the Mississippian culture spread in the, in the terms of pottery types and motifs, which means symbols. Uh, that were found on different artifacts like shell, uh, shell plates and, met and copper plates and things like that. So that's how we kind of trace the spread of that, of that culture. And also, 
the spread of items themselves because you can actually source church. You can actually look at the rock that it's made from and chemically test it and know that some of our arrowheads and spear points or whatever actually come from the Watchtower Mountains because it's only made out of a Novaculite shirt that was found in that region and only that region alone. So we know that there had to be a lot of good trade networks going on and we do that by sourcing the raw materials and figuring out where the stuff is from. Uh, corn. Corn took over. And now, you guys, corn is, you don't really, we don't really think about it, even though corn makes up like most of our food today, <laughs> whether it be our soda or our packing materials, that's not food, but anyway, we use corn for so much. But the, the thing about corn is that it changed everything about the lifestyle for the American Indians. When you grow corn, you grow oodles more than you could ever possibly eat in your lifetime. And so the, the fact that corn packs such a punch and, and it's so, uh, there's so much of it as opposed to like the little tiny grains that they were, that they were uh, um, taking advantage of in the environment before and you know just these little things corn makes so much food to feed people that it makes a surplus so that you get all this extra time to be like oh I don't have anything to do let's build a mound or you know I mean they're building mounds before that but it gave a lot of extra time for people to organize themselves into the chiefdoms that they had during the Mississippi and these big huge um, these big huge sites that that were just known for like magnetizing everybody together and, and bringing these huge rendezvous every year for trade items and stuff. And so it also it allows not only for there to be a lot of food to feed the people, but it also allows for, uh, for lots of food to be left over over the season so that if there's a bad drought or something, you're not going to get as affected the next year because you have extra food left behind, extra food source. So, and also, you can grind corn down to porridge and uh, feed the babies and get them to stop nursing, and that makes you pregnant again. So your, your birth spaces are much smaller, and so the population expands exponentially with corn agriculture. So corn really changed so much. Nobody really thinks about corn, but it really did make a humongous difference in the culture. So they had something to trade, too. Lots of corn. You know, in the mountains of the Ozarks, where some Mississippians were, they're like, we can't grow corn. So corn became like a money item. They could, you know, trade corn for stone and stuff. So, you know, that it really did make a big difference. And for anybody, just to throw a name out, for anybody that um, wants to know of the most important Mississippian site ever known, it's called Cahokia. And it's, uh, it's in Illinois, uh, due east of St. Louis, Missouri. So it was a gigantic site, the main mound actually covers the entire the entirety of my whole site. Um, Monk's Mound is 17 acres at its base, so it's gigantic. It's actually the same uh, base as the Great Pyramid, except it's not quite as tall. So very important site uh, if you ever get a chance to go up to Cahokia. But you should come to Park Inn instead, because look, there's a great mound there. And there's great artifacts that you can see. But they, the Mississippians, again, I said, they made beautiful things, okay? So they just made beautiful pottery, really, you know, beautiful different kinds of uh, uh, stone tools. And then in the middle there, I've got a shell uh, a gorget, which is a, a necklace pendant. And of course, they did have incredible earthworks as well. Um, some of our artifacts uh, that were found at Parkin as well are uh, small uh, other gorgets that were uh, from, you know, Gulf uh, Coast uh, marine shell. We've got um, a couple of chunky stones, which were those big uh, uh, hard stone things that were probably only one per village uh, for a ceremonial game called Chunky. And then we've got some really great pottery. We've got our three head pots. Uh, these are the three that were found at Parkin and they still luckily are in our museum. And uh, head pots were something that we don't really understand at all. It's a very interesting, mysterious part of Mississippian culture. They were only found in Northeast Arkansas and Southeast Missouri. And there's only about 90 of them known. So there are very few and far between, and the three from Park, and, and who, who knows, there may be some still on the ground. That's really cool. But those are the three that we have at Park. And. But um, everything was honky dory, and they were making their pottery and their cool artifacts and their mound and having a good time. And then June of 1541, they're hanging around catching their turtles and hunting and stuff, and these dudes come over with these gigantic deer and thunder sticks. 
gigantic deer were horses, of course, but the Indians didn't know what a horse was, so they called them gigantic deer, and the thundersticks were guns. So the Spanish came through, and uh, the story goes at Parkin is that the, the uh, Chief Kosky knew that there was some trouble brewing and decided to uh, uh, meet these folks at the gate and say, welcome to our village, do you want to come in, we'll give you some food and all that. And supposedly it was the only, uh, uh, one of the few peaceful encounters that the Spanish had with the American Indians because they didn't get flattened at that point. Only afterwards by the disease and stuff, but at, at that time there wasn't an all-out war. But the one really cool thing, here's DeSoto, DeSoto, we have a bead, uh, we have a bell, I'm trying to get a little bit faster here. So, but the route around, they bumbled around the south for two years before they hit Parkin. Um, and then uh, at Parkin, one of the cool things that happened is that, again, they were, uh, the Indians were uh, dealing with a, supposedly a seven-year drought and they decided to ask uh, DeSoto to pray to his gods to see if it would rain. Because Koski wasn't doing a good job of it, of praying to whatever the American Indians uh, spirits there were. So they thought, well, let's ask these guys because they look a little bit important with their crazy helmets and their you know, gigantic deer that they can talk to. So maybe they're like more godly than our chief. So, uh, so they... DeSoto got his guys to fell two trees and they built a big cross and they raised it on top of the mound. And there were accounts that were brought back to Spain from the surviving people of the DeSoto expedition. And all three accounts, you know, have very specific uh, details on this day and what happened. And basically this story wasn't really known until, you know, like the 1980s or 90s long after, 20 years after the site at Parkin had been excavated at the beginning. So when they were first excavating, they didn't even know DeSoto was there. But then by the 90s, they were like, wait, you know, there was, there was a cross on the mound? And then they went back and looked at the 1960s stuff in the, in the museum and said, what's that big chunk of wood that was found on top of the mound in the 1960s? And they dated it and it turned out to be like the correct date. Um, but it was a radiocarbon date, so that was really, you know, long on either side of error. So just this past April, um, our archaeologist Jeff Mitchum from the Arkansas Archaeological Survey went to the mound and dug up the rest of the post. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was an absolutely like an archaeologist's dream. They took out the maps and the coordinates from the 1960s and said, well, it should be right here. And like literally two and a half feet down, they literally found the post that had still been covered in plastic from the 1960s. <laughs> anyway, so they found the post, they took it out, they had this big parade. It really should have been a parade because they were very excited about this. But they brought it to, to uh, this guy, uh, this uh, tree ring expert named Dave Stolley at the uh, University of Arkansas Fayetteville. And um, they started picking around at it to get a, they wanted to get a tree ring date to say that this thing was cut in 1541. And unfortunately, it was, it was very depressing, but it turned out that the wood had deteriorated so much that they couldn't figure the date out. Uh, so they got, they sent in more radiocarbon samples, but again, that's going to come out with an error. If it was 1541, we would have had like a grand party and, you know, it would have been so cool. But it's still possible that the post that we have that came out of the mound is the, is the base of the cross. Um, it's, it's much bigger than a house post would be, so that's why they think it, it, it has a good possibility of being that. And it does date range in the correct time. So we may have a really cool uh, Christian, early Christian Arkansas artifact. Um, but anyway, that was the end of that. And DeSoto left, and then the Indians left very soon afterwards. Um, again, reorganized themselves into different cultures that we have today. What would have happened to the Mississippians if the Europeans hadn't arrived is a question that a lot of people ask because, of course, we think, oh, the Europeans, you know, they destroyed the culture, which we did, essentially. Um, the American Indians have, have had a long history of just being wiped out both physically and spiritually and, and culturally by, by the, the arrival of the Europeans by having them be pushed around everywhere. But um, a lot of scholars actually really do think that even though when the Europeans arrived, there weren't, there, the Cahokia wasn't there. The big, huge chiefdoms just weren't there. There were some smaller chiefdoms that were there when the Europeans arrived. But they really don't think they would have become full-fledged state societies because of the, um, the um, 
I'm not gonna use the word because that's a bad word. Uh, I was gonna say, I'm not gonna say it. Anyway, they, they think that the people, see my timer's done, I set my timer for 40 minutes. Thank you. Um, but they don't think that it would have turned into a big state society because the raw materials just weren't there, no metal, okay? Um, not to go all guns, germs, and steel on everyone, but there was no metal. You know, I mean, there just weren't the kind of things, the technologies in place without adopting a European, uh, like, way to become more European. They were fine for 12,000 years. <laughs> there was no reason, like, it didn't matter that they weren't, but the problem was, was that they just kind of got, uh, uh, the populations grew too much with that corn agriculture that they really honestly couldn't sustain themselves. So they would have had to drop back a little bit and, and just become happy hunter-gatherer people. Uh, and that would have lasted for forever if, if Europeans hadn't shown up. So, but the, the question is, you know, would, would, they have, would they have gotten higher? And, and a lot of people say no. Um, but again, that doesn't really mean much because they were, again, they, they sustained themselves for 12,000 years on this continent without anybody else's help. So, anyway, I, uh, I, uh, first of all, I do have a couple pamphlets about the park on that back table. Um, but I do invite anybody to come to the park in any capacity, whether it's just be on your own on a weekend, on a weekday, if you have any kind of groups that want to come. We take, we see all kinds of groups, 4-H, you know, regular public school, private school, home school, scout, we have scout programs. Uh, Ryan, my co-interpreter, and I are both uh, um, uh, merit badge counselors, so we do both regular Cub Scout and Boy Scout stuff. We do all kinds of stuff. So I'd love to see you at the park. Um, and... Again, my pamphlets are back there. If you need a business card, I have one here. So just let me know if you want to get in touch with me. But thanks so much for coming. And um, I'm here for questions now. Or you can just go. <laughs> but you know, it's so hot out there, you might as well stay here and hang out for a while. <laughs> yes? Were there cemeteries? Oh, good. That's a good question. You know, before I became a park interpreter, my specialty was ancient Egyptian bones. So I was a I was an ancient Egyptian bioarchaeologist before I started with this. So of course I know about the the cemeteries. No, there were not cemeteries as we know them. The uh, the folks were buried within, uh, underneath the floors or between the houses, and there are about 35 individuals that were excavated from Parkin that are now in Fayetteville in a uh, a facility there that they may eventually get reburied at Parkin. Uh, but I got to excavate. Uh, some remains from a sister site, from a, a site called Richards Bridge these past two summers. Um, and it's a, a site that looks very similar to Parkin. And we found all the people underneath the house floors and between the houses. So they didn't have sort of proper, not proper, proper, but you know, they didn't have like separated burial grounds. They kept their family in the house, which makes sense. I know it sounds creepy, but it's not because you want to keep your spirits together in the same household. So, no, no big grand cemeteries. There were some mounds at Toltec, you know, that had burials. And, you know, the elite people were buried in mounds at, at other sites. But we don't know if the elite people were buried at Parkin at, on, you know, on, on another mound or something. So we don't have evidence of that. Yeah? They don't see any, there's no uh, pattern that was recognizable uh, to the archaeologists when they dug the houses. They don't know if, um, you know, it's hard to tell what a family group is because there's not enough artifacts left behind, you know, like our houses have photo albums in them so we can look on the wall and say, look, these people are related. But they didn't, we didn't have any kind of evidence like that. And as far, I thought where you were going with that, I thought you were gonna ask if they were organized in like rows and stuff like that. But there was absolutely no pattern, whether it be family pattern or, or um, um, spatial patterning that, that they were really able to tell from the excavation of the houses. And at Richard's Bridge, the other site that I just mentioned that they've been excavating for two years, uh, they're also not really finding patterns for that place either. So I don't know if they just put their house like, I could fit right between there, you know, and they jammed it in there, uh, or what? Because you think after 200 years, generations are going to expand. And where did they go when they expand? I have no idea. I mean, Egyptians build up. 
farms get bigger, but the bounding of the, the, the village makes you wonder how, how over four or five generations do, do you, I guess they were marrying their, their females out, so they were going to other villages, because they had to marry out, obviously, to keep the genetics good. Not that they knew about genetics, but family traditions. Yes? Were there, is there any evidence of workshops, like ceramics? Or oh, like specialized areas? Yeah. They haven't found any of that either. Uh, the, there, there had to have been local places in the village that they were making pottery. Some people say that uh, every household made their own pottery. But with some of the like head pots and things, there had to be a specialist. There had to be an artist that was, was doing that. And actually, there's evidence of one uh, set of head pots. There's four of them. They're separate now. Uh, one one is, was at Parkin and now it's in Northwest Arkansas. One's at the Smithsonian, one's at the Field Museum, and one's in a private collection, and they all look almost, they, they, they look so similar that they're almost positive they were made by the same artist. So there obviously were artisans, but nobody's ever found an artisan workshop, at least at Parkin. Now, Cahokia, they probably found different workshop areas because it's a big enough site. But, yeah. Yes? Do you find anything in as far as I understand, nobody's done anything with malaria. Because you got to get... Because uh, you're in the right spot. <laughs> right, right, right. I have not seen anybody do anything with malaria. Um, there is some evidence of uh, tuberculosis uh, from the, the skeletal remains, mm -hmm. but not the actual physical evidence with the, you know, like yeah. seeing the tuberculosis uh, bacterium in there. Nobody's ever done anything at that level. It's always just been macro, macro uh, studying of the bones, but nobody's ever done destructive analysis with that stuff yet. Yes, we are in the right place for malaria. And a lot of people say, oh, the rice, uh, modern rice fields brought the mosquitoes. No, no, that place was a swamp before it was rice fields. So it was always that kind of environment. So there were surely mosquitoes. Now they do have evidence of, um, I don't know if it's particularly at Parkin, but in general there were like smudge pots that were found where they were burning corn cobs and other things that could smolder to keep mosquitoes out of the house. So we know mosquitoes were an issue, but we don't actually have the physical um, DNA evidence for the... And how's the nutrition there in the mines, like in the bones? Is it, are the people very diverse diet? Yeah, they, yes, the, the diet was fairly diverse. Um, so they're not getting fat from the corn? <laughs> no, not getting fat from corn. I don't think anybody ever got fat in ancient times. <laughs> Uh, and, and the reason is because the meat was, was so lean that they were actually growing sunflowers to get the oil out to add meat uh, uh, fat to their diet. So when you think about the other things that bring us our fat, they were, they were hunting all of these incredible, they didn't have any domesticated animals in, in uh, ancient North America, um, except for the dog. And I think there was only one site where they had evidence of them eating a dog. So they didn't raise animals for, for meat, so all of their meat was totally lean. And fish, of course, lean, no fat. So, but they had enough diversity in terms of whatever they hunted, what they farmed, and what they gathered. Because there was lots of gathered seeds in the archeology span at Parkin. Uh, other wild things that were gathered that you would think that, oh, since we have corn now, let's just eat corn. They still continued their gathering tradition at Parkin. Um, and, and they've seen that through the, through the archeology span of the, of the trash pits and going through all the, all the food remains and stuff, so. And I could talk about food all day, so we should probably get off that topic. Anything else? Well, thank you very much, I appreciate you.